This is the Saturday to Sunday Football Podcast. This is where it all counts. This is why we're here. This is why each one of us are here. And now, here's your host. And the summer seminar series keeps rolling along. This is Matt Caraccio of the Saturday to Sunday Football Podcast. And I am beyond excited as we keep trying to bring each and every one of us closer to that game we are so passionate about on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. I am hoping that this presenter, I mean, I, there are, I've had many presenters, but this presenter among many has been somebody who I've considered uh, not only uh, a friend, a, a resource, but also a mentor, somebody that has really opened my eyes to this world. I am talking about the curator of the outstanding website that is Football Beyond the Stats, as well as the owner of Movement to Mastery. And more recently, this person is about to set fire to the coaching landscape with an amazing, amazing educational company and program called Emergence. I am talking about the one, the only Mr. Sean Mishka. Sean Welcome to the Saturday to Sunday football podcast. Matt, my friend, you are far too kind. Uh, but as always, I uh, hope you know that it's certainly a shared mentorship. So you teach me just as much as I could ever teach you. Uh, I know I've told you that before, but I certainly want to tell you that on the air. Uh, I couldn't be more pleased to be a part of what you're doing here with the summer seminar series yet once again. So thank you for having me back for the second year in a row. Uh, I couldn't be more pleased and stoked uh, to make this thing happen here this summer. Well, the pleasure is really entirely ours. And to be very honest with you, I think that you are, and I've said this to you many times as well, you are really one of the best ambassadors any subject could ever ask for, which is why I think your presence is not just something that we desire, but I think something that everybody out there who is learning and becoming acquainted with in terms of what it is to move and uh, movement science and skill acquisition, I, I think they must, they must, must, must hear from you when it comes to this discipline. So before we get into it, Sean, I mean, I know you are on the brink, nay, I say kind of the precipice of releasing or being uh, involved in this educational company called Emergence. And I'd be remiss if I didn't at least start there. What, well, what I, is you, Emergence? Yeah, you know, Matt, when we really break it down, the thing that I've gotten from the last two years of, of being in the really humbling position to uh, found and, and, and be this director or facilitator of the educational experience known as the Sport Movement Skill Conference over the last two years, which obviously you did a fantastic job presenting at here in 2019 on the Problem Solver Paradigm. Um, I was so stoked to hear what you had to say and the information and ideas that you shared. Uh, I actually had an NFL player, an all pro at that, sit in on your presentation, and, and he's still literally talking about it to this day. We, we talked about you and, and our interactions uh, together back in May. So first off, first and foremost, I, I do appreciate you sharing your knowledge in that way. But um, one thing that has happened over these last two years at the Sport Movement Skill Conference through integration and then this year in 2019 through this cohesion and convergence type of theme and approach one resounding theme sort of kept coming up and and the thing that i saw was that the community is a extraordinarily hungry to really get closer to the truth number one number two or b we found that there's still a lot of confusion these ideas, specifically those that exist within some of the paradigms that you and I sort of hold near and dear to our hearts, there's a lot of misunderstood ideas and terms and concepts, and it sort of intimidates people to a certain degree within the community. And because of that, uh, my friend Tyler Yerby and I had started sort of kicking the can down the road with forming some sort of educational project that was centered around trying to lock arms with the entire community and try to get closer to that truth, try to uncover the layers and connect the dots that exist with many of these concepts, many of these theories, many of these ideas. Not saying that we already have the truth or know the truth, but to start asking those questions and the lock arms with the right people across the community to get us closer to it. And so really when we look at the company emergence and what formed from this union was this this idea that like emergence in human movement systems 
it self-organized and it found itself in this place where we feel where we can exist and exchange information with the community in this way and couple together uh, with the problems that exist within our movement science space. And of course, I'm throwing a lot of puns in there and they are intended because I think this whole learning project is one that actually has a certain analogous uh, approach towards that, which was happening for our athletes as well. This information reciprocal mutual energy exchange between ourselves as this emergence brand and that what the, the hopefully the community wants and needs as well. And so we're just kind of piecing together some ideas. Um, we're, we're kind of taking this approach where we are letting it naturally flow and emerge in a really unrehearsed type fashion. We're trying to get out there and hear many of the thoughts and the ideas that exist within not only the thought leaders, such as many of the individuals that presented at the Sport Movement Skill Conference in these last two years, but also the people that we constantly converse with, the attendees and the delegates that obviously poured their time and effort and energy and commitment into the community as well, because all of us together lock arms to create this bigger movement, as you and I always talk about. You being a major component piece to that, all of us really have an, an R, a component piece to that. And so to kind of summarize things there, we're just allowing things to unfold and emerge just like they would in the natural, dynamic, complex, adaptive environment. And our first uh, learning project within this bigger brand that is Emergence is going to be a course called Underpinnings. And the underpinnings is many of the scientific, theoretical, and conceptual uh, principle-based ideas specifically with utilizing an ecological dynamics framework to investigate movement behavior in context. So we talk about things such as using a systems lens. We talk about things like information movement coupling and the perceptions and cognitions and actions and how those relationships underpin movement behavior in sport. Uh, we talk a lot about affordances. We talk a lot about um, investigating and analyzing movement behavior in context and what that means, that evaluative lens as a performance professional and what we can do as sport movement specialists to guide and facilitate uh, hopefully more functional movement behavior in sport. So I know that was a pretty wordy answer to your question there. Hopefully it uh, started to open a can of worms for us, depending on where we want to go and how we want to go there. But uh, we, Tyler and myself, as well as another, a bunch of other individuals who are involved in it, uh, Jared Sigmund, uh, Garrett Boyum, and then Michael Zwiefel, who you've had on last year in the summer seminar series. Uh, we saw have all locked arms in order to take this thing hopefully to another level and uncover some layers uh, where we can start to connect some dots. Well, I mean, the entire list of individuals that are associated from Tyler to Mike to Jared to Sigmund, I mean, you're talking about, uh, I mean, extraordinary minds, uh, you know, really on every level that are really locking arms to create this experience. And I know you guys are still in the beginning phases underpinnings as being that major kind of uh, that major kind of product that's going to be released to help the world uh, of coaching as well as evaluation, as well as any of those individuals that work with sports professionals really begin to understand, you know, the nature and understanding of where all of this kind of understanding of movement behavior comes from. And I, and I kind of want to start there and, and maybe, maybe maybe I'm asking for uh, a synopsis, unfortunately, of underpinnings. But but in many ways, maybe that's kind of where a lot of people do begin. And I guess as we discuss and try to understand the nature of the problems that players face on the field, and trying to understand where what that is, you know, from an evaluative perspective, you talked about energy flows, which I still think is a very um, fascinating idea because i think we're only beginning to understand that concept in its entirety i mean maybe any of these concepts in their entirety but um it's certainly something that piques my interest extraordinarily and as well as maybe this idea of like you said you know um just the 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 kind of reciprocity that exists between the environment and the player i guess where i want to ask you to start is for those of us out there that may not understand the nature of the problems that players face on the field. 
through this lens. Can you give us a perspective from your course in terms of underpinnings? From an underpinnings perspective, what is the nature of the problems athletes are facing? Yeah, great, great question. Wonderful question that could take us in so many different directions, but I love it because I think we are just hitting the tip of the iceberg uh, with as a community, as a neighborhood, if you will, if you remember my presentation back at the Sport Movement Skill Conference. Um, you know, Matt, you, you know, specifically because of many of our conversations and many of our uh, really deep interactions around some of these ideas, you know how I view sport movement. I view sport movement from a problem solving perspective, much of like what you do with your problem solver paradigm. Uh, of course, um, I'm always humbled when I hear you talk about it because you're talking about many of the things that I have viewed sport movement through or the lens that I've used to view sport movement behavior through for such a long period of time. And it's one where we do give equal symmetrical ode to or homage to both the problem and the solution or solver, right? Both the problem existing in the environment and the tasks that need to be solved there and the solutions in the solver and how they connect to that problem. You know, in the ecological dynamics perspective and, and then through the course of underpinnings, as well as any conversations that I have with the majority of people, I always implore people to start viewing sport movement through this lens, right? If we can view sport as nothing but problem solving activities where movements are used to produce those necessary solutions, as Dr. Mel Siff and Dr. Yerber Koshansky stated way back in super training, then all of a sudden our craft, both from an evaluator standpoint, as well as a performance professional or sport movement specialist perspective, starts to be geared around skill being something that is living, breathing. It happens through this information and energy exchange between the solver and how he or she maintains functional, purposeful contact with the peculiar problems that he or she intends to solve. And all of a sudden, then those problems in the information and energy distribution that exists in the world there and how we exchange it, becomes at the forefront of how our movement is channeled and coupled to interact with that problem. And so for me, it's really underpinnings was a way for us to actually really peel back some of the layers. You know, my man Nikolai Bernstein once said, no natural phenomenon can be understood without carefully considering how it emerged. That phenomenon, I believe, is this functional behavioral unit known as a movement solution. It's the perceptions and the cognitions and the actions and the ways that those subsystems interact to underpin the movement behaviors in sport. It's those self-organization properties and, and how that is assembled to intertwine and compose and form to couple a movement solution to a goal-directed activity, because that's really what our sport is about, right? And so when we really start to look at that, you know, something you mentioned in there in regards to those energy distributions and this information that exists, often we just use this as sort of this umbrella ambiguous term, you know, how that player connects to the world. Like that's something that's ambiguously talked about. But we in underpinnings really tried to kind of peel back the layers on that. We spent a whole, we, it's a five part course, which I think takes place over like a five to six hour period of time. Uh, I haven't seen the actual edits yet, so I apologize if it's either less or more than that. But that's sort of our sh what we're targeting. And what we're really looking at there and what we spent a good amount of portion of the course, in fact, a one fifth of the course, we talked about sort of how the degrees of freedom within those respective dimensions, again, of perceptions, cognitions and actions, how they intertwine with circular causality to interact with those energy distributions in the world, with the information in the world, the specifying information that exists out there for that performer and that player to connect to in their own unique and special way. Because you know as well as I do, when you start to turn your lens as an evaluator on this perspective, all of a sudden you realize that the human or the athlete should not be separated from the problem in the environment, right? They should not be studied separately, nor should we try to train them separately if, you're, if I'm talking to some movement coaches out there, right, or football coaches at that. 
And so we're really trying to present problems for athletes to solve. So their movement toolbox gets greater breadth to it as well as greater depth. So that's where some of the ideas uh, from JJ Gibson obviously come into play with direct perception and some of the ideas that are are really oriented around perceptual attunement and sensitivity, a heightened sensitivity to the specifying information that exists within that problem that we can interact with that we will then as a mover or as a player organize our movement solutions around. And, and those are things and topics that obviously we just don't discuss very much, not only as an evaluator, we're almost just taking that person and having them exist in a vacuum. I mean, obviously the NFL combine wouldn't be what it is if we weren't already doing that as a community. And we're trying to kind of knock down those, um, those barriers that exist there of what people or how people have constantly viewed sport movement through. And, and of course, then for me as a sport movement specialist, it's about guiding and facilitating those self-organized emergent movement solutions to be more functionally connected to the problems and the range of problems, the variability or complexity of problems that I know my players are going to have to face on an NFL Sunday. So all of a sudden, things like rote repetition are no longer a thing. Things like movement actions taking place in isolation, separated from the world or the problem that the individual has to solve is no longer a thing. I'm trying to create or facilitate enhanced, dexterous movement problem solvers as a sport movement specialist. And then as an evaluator, you're almost doing the same. What is the depth and breadth of that person's movement toolbox? I know last year we sat here and we discussed Saquon Barkley then, who uh, with my blog of my pre-draft movement blog uh, on Saquon, and of course he went on then to become my mover of the year for 2018, the first rookie to ever do so. And, and when I think about where he can go and what he can do, it's really about he's already probably the best or most efficacious a uh, one-on-one -on -one problem solver in the entire NFL. And it's in existing in that complexity of problem when the complexity changes and when it gains um, greater abundance of information or there's extra layers of information or energy for him to interact with, maybe for him to become more attuned to the detail of the information. It's his perception and then his decision-making that sort of intertwines with it's a circular causality type of relationship. Again, it has uh, a mutual reciprocal relationship, even then within in between levels within that movement solution. And then the actions that kind of connect to that. So I know I kind of gave a mouthful there and we added a bunch of layers. That's essentially what underpin underpinnings is about, but it's exactly how I know both you as an evaluator view movement problem solving under this paradigm and how me as a sport movement specialist sort of tries to stand and exist with. So I'm just setting problems for my individuals to go solve and then allowing them and hopefully guiding them to connect with that information uh, more functionally and more effectively as well. I mean, the, the, the number of ways to go with this conversation is really, it's mind boggling because there's so many points I would love to tease out. The first thing that I, I think that I really kind of stands with me is is this duality or this this constant conflict between reductionism and yet not being reductionist but yet in some ways i wonder and and, and please feel free to disagree with me because as we do that's part of our mentorship you tell me i'm wrong um but in some ways it seems like we are being forced to reduce to some level the problems that are inherent which so in other words not not totally ignoring the idea that there is this sort of hierarchical or maybe a uh, multi-system type of situation that players are dealing with on the field. But from a coaching perspective, from an evaluative perspective, maybe we're trying to capture or reduce the problem areas the player is having. Is that, is that a bad, is that a bad way to synthesize it? Or is that somewhat, within the realm of accuracy? And if it's not, or if it is, to what degree does it need to be improved upon? I, I think that's a fantastic question that I wish we had a hard set answer to. Uh, I think it has to be done to a certain degree simply because we have to try to 
make comparisons between performers if you're an evaluator uh, or as a sport movement specialist or football coach, you have to be able to determine what the most optimal or correct problem solution exists there, what that relationship may look like for the performer. So we have to make certain, we have to kind of put ourselves out on the limb in both of those respective niches that we exist in, right? To make um, analysis a little bit more accurate for the performer, because otherwise, you know, we're just out there sort of on a whim trying well, to determine I, where know, they let me exist. Ask you, yeah, let ahead. me ask you something, Sean. So, because if we don't, then we're just playing the game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that's sort of where I was going with it from a sport movement specialist standpoint, because obviously that's where I exist. And hopefully I'm speaking to some football coaches there as well. Right. So it isn't just allowing people to play the game or or letting the game dictate what happens. Right. It is in that mutual reciprocal relationship. And, you know, I put out a blog back at the beginning of 2018, the 2018 season, where it was entitled Respect the Problem. And the only reason why I said that is it was we have to respect the problem for what it stands for, what the range of problems could um, be presented to that respective performer based on their position and based on the level of football they play at, uh, but also the information that flows from those problems in the affordances that exist there, right? The invitations, the opportunities in these problems and in the whole manifold or bandwidth of that problem. And so I think there is something to there where we have to reduce them to a certain degree. But I think us in this football community on both sides of the coin, both the, the scouting and evaluator and analysis lens, as well as then the sport movement specialist or football coaching lens, I think we've been far too guilty of isolating and reducing it too much. And I think that's the problem that we run into there when we're not viewing it enough in that system's perspective. I think everybody would be well versed, everybody that's listening out there, and there's a number of, and maybe you could link it even when you put this out, uh, a, a place called or a website called Systems Innovation has a number of courses out there that are free for people that whether, no matter where you exist and no matter what you believe within this realm or within this niche and community, I would implore people to even just get enlightened a little bit in regards to a more systems lens or paradigm of viewing things, right? If we're ever going to get to that problem solver paradigm, both on your end, Matt, or mine, my friend, like we, either one of us views as a problem solving paradigm, right? But if we're ever going to get to that point and we make it have or allow it to have practical application for us in our craft, we have to understand a systems lens and a systems way of viewing things. And all of a sudden, we don't look at it as the parts anymore. We look at it as the whole, number one, in the underlying dynamics, in the complexity. Like we embrace that complexity, right? We know that there's always going to be something missed then because we can't fully see all levels and all dimensions of that system. But yet at the same token, we can respect it. And we try to appreciate the complexity that lives there, the underlying dynamics that create these interrelationships as they exist. So we don't try to look at this analytical lens down to the pieces and the parts per se, but we synthesize them together in regards to how those component parts of those respective systems will interact and how they relate to one another to create and form this cohesive emergence of a whole. And that to me is a totally different way of viewing things. And only by existing there can we fully respect the problems then that our performers are, are going to go solve. And, and so I think we do have to reduce it, but we have to be careful to not isolate and reduce it too much. So we water it down to be at a place where it no longer even resembles that, which happens on an NFL Sunday. Well, and I, and I love the fact that you're talking about reductionism through a, a many different lenses because we're not looking at it as a definitive kind of definition for how we should view things. Rather, we're looking at it as a way of understanding, you know, the complexity of maybe our own task as coaches or as evaluators. We, ha we have to reduce to some level in order to understand, though, this the systems or the problems or the, the nature of the problems that each of these athletes is facing. And it, and it really brought me to something where over this past year, as I began to really kind of embrace this, you know, I, I found myself thinking about, well, what if he didn't have longer arms? Like, what if he didn't have longer arms? How does the not, how does not having longer arms shape the way you're going to use your strength 
in terms of acceleration or your get off on the football or whatever the case may be. And, and now the fact that I know that you're not very flexible at the waist, how does that still shape along with your shorter arms? How does that shape the solution that you're going to see on the field? And now that it is a pressure situation, now that it is third and two and you are an offensive lineman and now we're in the fourth quarter and we're down by, you know, seven points, you know, to what degree, since the ball's being run to your side, did that shape the way you handled the block? And now instead of saying that you did it technically, wrong did you accomplish your goal and if you accomplished your goal then maybe then it was functional given your constraints in the situation that was at hand maybe you did what was necessary for you in that moment and i think that's where this line of discussion really opens up not pandora's box but it almost invites a layer of scrutiny that maybe tells such a rich and amazing story about the athlete and who they are and what they are all about. And it's it's a lot of what we'll have from we had from previous presenters about who is skill and what is skill. I it really is fantastic. But I'm gonna ask you something, Sean. I'm gonna I'm gonna transition this to something that you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. And I'm gonna ask us to maybe unpack this because I do think that there's an, a very rich connection here. We don't, okay, so from right now, if I'm sitting here listening to this, uh, okay, you don't want me to reduce the problem down to a single variable. You want me to invite the variables associated to this problem that I've reduced my lens to. You want me to invite a discussion about how those variables are all interacting within this problem. Okay, I'm with you. Now, my question is, you spoke about this information energy exchange and how maybe affordances can kind of capture that type of thing. We had Dominic Orth on earlier in this series, and he spoke about how affordances maybe were meant to capture this relationship between the player and the environment, that that might be the mechanism by which we capture this relationship. So I love that you took in the word energy, because if I remember back to, you know, um, uh, God, I'm going to forget his name perfectly. So we would edit this out if I was going to be perfect, but we're not. We're emerging here as we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but Bertolofini, who once said that there was a connection between energy, and he noted how if you see something, you're going to move in a certain way. So there is this kind of information energy connection that mm-hmm. could exist. So do you think you can you could do that for us and maybe talk about some of this information energy connection and affordances and where it exists so as an evaluator or coach I can better understand maybe how to manage these systems or create better systems for working with I I will certainly try my friend because I believe that it's number one it's the most fascinating thing in my world on a day-to-day basis right to see how these respective players that I work with that are obviously at the highest level of mastery and skill all interact with similar behaving problems, but in sometimes vastly different ways. And so I believe that this investigation of information and the way that it couples movement or the the solution and the solver with the problem in the environment that they exist as a a bigger system of or part, that I believe it's that investigation of information that holds some of the key for us to really understand movement problem solving. And the reason why I say that is, I know you made the mention of the quote right prior to this point, but I'll raise you a quote there where J.J. Gibson back in 79 said, we perceive to act, but we act to perceive, right? So the two are always coupled together as one. What Gibson really in his ecological approach to perception started to uncover was this idea of affordances. So for those of you who exist out there, now granted they've heard Dominic speak to it probably at length, but we can never really talk about it enough because I believe every problem in the football world exists in this sort of rich landscape of affordances, right? That's all it is. is, And if those of you who are listening out there hear this word affordances, all I'm really speaking to here are invitations or opportunities for action. It's a gap to run through. It's a it's a player within a certain space of you. It's a blockability if you are an offensive tackle. Like I have this ability to interact with the opponent and the problem and my teammates all as one present nothing but a rich landscape of affordances. And these affordances then allow us to essentially link perception and action together between the solver and the problem that he exists as a bigger part of. 
So using like a Saquon Barkley example, there are certain affordances at the first level. There are certain affordances at the second level and there's certain uh, affordances at the third level, right? And those affordances are going to change based on the problems that he's being presented with in the way that he's interacting with this information. This information and this energy distribution that exists out there are essentially our perceptual abilities to detect the information and energy as it exists as, a, as in reference to us and our action capabilities, right? Like Saquon Barkley's action capabilities are significantly different than Sean Mishka's, okay? And so when he and I both interact with this information, certain affordances are gonna be specified to him, me. They're going to be different, obviously, because we have different action capabilities. But where you were going with your point in between question and answer here was certain weaknesses that have been, or characteristics rather, that have been viewed as weaknesses, whether it's in the movement or the physical structures or characteristics, maybe they're not actually weaknesses. Sometimes those things that make us different than all other performers actually just are strengths because we can still find ways to solve the problems functionally because affordances sort of say that we can, right? Like that person just won't accept the same affordance as another performer. They maybe have a different solution. They see the information, they perceive the information, they feel the information differently. And because the information specifies affordances or the invitations and opportunities that are going to exist in that respective problem, we still probably have an opportunity to interact with it in different ways. And so that's why affordances and information become such a vital thing for us to investigate. And that's exactly why I said we must respect the problem and the complexity that exists there. Because again, the problem has degrees of freedom, just like the solution or just like the solver does, right? And because of that, and those degrees of freedom are just different ways that it can be organized and we can still get to a certain outcome because of the underlying dynamics in the process of execution are going to allow us to just have this natural self-organized emergence of those degrees of freedom. So when a problem and a solver interact with one another and they're going, the solver is going to find certain opportunities and invitations to act within that information. And if just like any invitation, they can choose to accept it, they could reject it, so they could not take it and move on to a different affordance, or they completely they could completely ignore it because they don't have the action capability of interacting with it, right? So it could be this active decision, but it also could be a more passive decision because they're not even finding the same gap. If if Saquon Barkley and I both get one-on-one -on -one in the open field with one of the better safeties in the league, he's going to perceive and detect different affordances for action than Sean Mishka will. There still might be an affordance for action for Sean Mishka, right? But it's probably not going to be the same as Saquon Barkley. Therefore, Matt, where we kind of get with this discussion in regards to understanding information that exists or the information that specifies certain affordances is understanding just how that player perceives and picks up and detects information in the world, what affordances for action they're more um, ready, I should say, to interact with, and which affordances they completely reject or ignore. And now we can start to speculate as to why they may re reject or ignore those affordances, which is exactly where I kind of live and breathe with my performers because most of my performers uh, are obviously very highly successful before they ever even get to me, right? But in order for me to guide their movement skill to be more functional, I want to widen the breadth of their toolbox. And that simply means either A, opening up their degrees of freedom so they have a bigger optimal grip over that landscape of affordances. They can interact with it in more ways. Or B, they can become more attuned to understand that information and what it means to them authentically and their movement solutions to begin with. And so I have to make certain, uh, let's just say assumptions, or I have to have certain speculations that I make off of the film that I'm investigating, just like you guys do from an evaluative lens. So you and I are both viewing the, 
the mover as this problem solver or under this problem solver paradigm. I'm just trying to attempt to do something different with that information than you are. You're trying to make it be something that says, this is where this guy fits. This is what he can do. This is what he can't do right now. Or at least this is the information or affordances that he's not accepting right now for whatever reason. Maybe you put him in a different system and all of a sudden, those are the affordances he not only perceives and detects, but he also accepts, depending on how that system is maybe guiding his intentions, his cognitions, his aims to act in a given way, will also then connect what he's perceiving and how he's attempting to act as well. No, I, I, I think this would, I mean, first of all, everything that you said, I mean, you could see me taking copious notes as, as I'm sure all of our listeners are as well. And it, this would be a perfect opportunity if, if technology, I mean, not that technology isn't spectacular, but if technology could finally catch up to where I am right now in my mind, this is like one of those multi-branching stories where I'd love input for everybody to take. Cause I have three things and Sean, so I'm going to let you kind of choose the direction based off of where you feel you would want to take this conversation it's, and you're happy and, and obliged to do them all. But I also want to make sure that, you know, where you feel the next kind of common issue is, because in my mind, I've circled the ideas of, you know, techniques for observation. So we can begin to really kind of assess, you know, the, the framework for the problems that our athletes may be facing or the players we're evaluating, you know, techniques that might be useful for us, uh, degrees of freedom. I mean, we spoke about degrees of freedom as being very important, that being almost a fundamental kind of axiomatic concept to this entire discussion, which I think is really important. I mean, you can't talk about any of this without degrees of freedom being understood and accepted. Or even this idea of development versus weakness. I mean, I find so 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 much. You know, we in the evaluation community, even coaches, we fall into this kind of almost um, dichotomy or black and white situation of it's either it's either good or bad, and nothing is developmental. So, I guess what I'm saying is there's three avenues that we could kind of explore here from you know, techniques of observation, how do we unpack the framework of the problems that our players are having? You know, what are we, we're not exactly what are we looking for, but what variables should we be keeping, keeping in mind? Um, degrees of freedom, that's a fundamental axiomatic concept to this, even this idea of ecological dynamics and, and your man, Nikolai Bernstein, I mean, we'd be remiss if we don't give, give due credit where due credit is due. And then also this idea of, Everything is either strong or weak. And what does developmental even mean? Is there really even such a thing as a weakness? Or is there really just everything is developmental? So I'm, I'm going to almost paint that picture to you. If we could have exploding icons show up on your screen and you could touch screen exactly what direction you'd want this episode to go. I really want to open it up to you because I think either way, we're going to get rich an awesome discussion there and we may and you could cover them all if you want but i just wanted to give you that opportunity to take the fork in the road and choose where you wanted to go so i i i lay myself as well as our listeners down in front of you well that's always the dangerous place to be when uh when you pose a number of different questions for me and give me a t couple different directions or a few different directions for me to go but i love uh, the self-organization and the emergence that hopefully will exist here because I think they are all viable directions and topics and paths to go down because they do start to take us down these rabbit holes that you and I enjoy going down so, so very much. Um, I'll start first things first where you started, which was those techniques for observation. And, and I think for me, I think it starts with a a paradigm shift to a certain degree. And I've all, I know we've already alluded to this over the, the first 30 minutes, right? It, this paradigm shift is a change in lens first and foremost, because potentially our techniques for observation, maybe our means or method of observation, such as through use of film analysis could potentially be enough if we just change our lens ever so slightly to view things from this problem solver paradigm perspective, right? Like if it shifts our thoughts and our ideas and our beliefs, essentially our form of life and who we are as a craftsman, right? Whether if you're a scout or an evaluator or whether you're on the sport movement skill acquisition or football coaching side, 
if we begin to change our observation point in our lens, in our perspective, all of a sudden I believe we would start to see extra layers of that evaluation because we start to see extra layers and dimensions of that movement skill and that are salt. We, or dare I say, are we changing our intention? Or yeah, we are. Our attention? And, and dude, when we change, I love it because you know when we change our intention, we also change our perception. And when we change our perception, we also change our actions or we change how we are interacting with that, which what we see in front of us. Right. So I would excuse argue- us, everybody. We just geeked out for a moment. Yeah, we that did. Was, we, that we was, certainly- there was a little there was a little nerdiness that happened right there. So <laughs> just uh, I mean, I'm just letting everybody know that was that was that was like, it, you know, it happened. So anyway, moving right along. So now I, I keep I let you go. Well, I almost threw in the the. Um, David Michaels and Claire Jacobs idea of direct learning in there of, uh, you know, we would change the education of attention, we would change the education of our intention, and we would change the calibration. And if we do that, we change the behavioral dynamics. I, that I, don't, I, don't, think, I don't think I don't think as much as I mean, we, we love him, Bobby Shroop. I don't know if he would love the calibration <laughs> attunement discussion. So Bobby, that's a shout out to you if you're ever if you're listening to this. So uh, big, big thing. I'll never forget the Samuel L. Jackson quote. So anyway, uh, so yes, please. I, I continue along, and if you had to mm-hmm. fast forward about thirty seconds, uh, we do apologize, <laughs> but we had to right there. Well, but I, Matt, I think you know it's a vital discussion to have because I believe if we use the information that is ha- at hand that we all have already grown accustomed to interacting with, such as the film, but we just change our lens. All of a sudden, we begin to see how the various component parts of those respective systems, and I'm talking not just within the solver or within the player and their characteristics, both structural and functional, and how those um, component parts create this solver, but also then the processes of execution and the underlying dynamics that exist within there and seeing the problem that is presented to the performer, I believe all of a sudden, maybe we have the right techniques of observation and we will see the information in a different light, right? It's kind of like the six could always be a nine if we just turn it upside down, right? And look at the same film, but through a different paradigm or just a different way of viewing things. And so for me there, I believe as we, if we do change this lens ever so slightly, we will begin to see the, the information and the movement coupling in a totally different way. We will see the human movement system acting as this complex adaptive system. And the reason why I throw that out there now is any complex adaptive system has self-organization properties to it. And when it has self-organization properties to it, we can start to understand how those degrees of freedom are being assembled, composed, and organized to meet the needs of the problem that exists in front of it. You know, when you start to understand complex systems, you realize that any complex system is united based on some source uh, of sort of common uniting type of uh, um, resource. And that resource from the problem and the solver is that information that we sort of talked about ad nauseum, right? Like that information then becomes this link. And so that's how degrees of freedom. And if I think about it or try to expand upon this ever so slightly for the listeners, I'm not just, and even those movement science junkies that are out there are probably thinking degrees of freedom simply from a motor system or biomechanical degrees of freedom. But if we're going to talk about it from a problem solver paradigm perspective, all of a sudden we can talk about the sensory and perceptual subsystems in the degrees of freedom that exists there. Dominic may have talked about that to a certain degree when he talked about climbers, right? Expert climbers interact with different or varying levels of that sensory subsystems. We, are, we don't just have one sensory system, right? It's not just a visual layer of information connection that we're trying to perceive. It's there's haptic and there's touch and maybe Dominic touched on that or or discuss that to a certain degree. Obviously, that happens in American football. There's this kinesthetic sense and um, proprioceptive awareness that exists in the sensory and perceptual qualities. And all of a sudden we start to understand our capabilities differently based on 
all of these degrees of freedom from a sensory and perceptual level in all of the dimensions that exist there. It's, it's both between levels and it's within levels of these respective subsystems. Then we can look at the cognitive degrees of freedom that ex can exist there. Obviously, performers can have different thoughts, different aims, different motivations. Um, they can have varying levels of anticipation that could potentially exist. Those cognitions are going to have degrees of freedom as well. There isn't just one way to solve any of these respective movement problems. And then finally, we can talk about the motor system and the action degrees of freedom, right? The, the way that the biomechanical degrees of freedom are being organized. We could have a lunge cut, we could have a power cut, we could have a crossover cut. All of these things exist. A guy could have his uh, inside foot forward, he could have his outside foot forward. I mean, all of these things, um, deg you know, degrees of freedom could be base of support, center of gravity. All of these things that we're referring to here that are functional biomechanical degrees of freedom. But it's not just viewing them and investigating those degrees of freedom in isolation, in an analytical part way. It's in interaction and in relation with those other subsystems. And that to me, when we talk about degrees of freedom and we talk about the emergent self-organized movement solution, I believe we have to investigate it all. And I know that there's gonna be some listeners out there who maybe like Bobby are saying, you're making it too complex. But the point that I would make to all here is that anyone who would tell you that sport movement doesn't exist in this complex lens hasn't watched enough sport movement and they're not being honest with themselves. It is more complex than we make it out to be often in our isolated reductionist lens for our cute, nice, neat way of explaining things. But oftentimes that cute, nice, neat way of explaining things is wrong. And it because it doesn't respect the problem and the complexity that exists there. And no, I think I, tying I, things together, you know, tying things together, then it, it bridges both of those gaps there between our an analysis in a synthetic way, right? Exactly. And, uh, it's very synthetic, right? Yeah. It, it's a synthesis of that, right? It's a synergy. And therefore, that's why our friend Rob Gray would say we must keep them coupled. He's not talking about just perception and just cognition and just action being coupled. He's talking about the environment and the, and the problem that it presents to the solver and the solver's intrinsic dynamics of their movement toolbox as well. All of those things have to be coupled. They have to, from an evaluative lens as well as from a development lens. And I think that's the other side, like tying in that last question then, when we think about this development versus weakness, many of my players, even some who are all pros, there's still going to be gaps in their movement toolbox, right? There's still things that I'm doing with guys that are all pros out on the field. I'm trying to widen their grip on their landscape of affordances, right? The way that they connect with the world. In fact, this year, you know, you probably know or will remember from previous years on my blog, I've talked about this. Last year, our theme as a whole collective unit, my players and I, was adaptability within adaptability. And really all that was is we know that the human movement system is a complex adaptive system. We tried to force our way into adaptability in everything that we did. You will find it interesting that this year, our theme was the honest expression of oneself. And so when you take that last point that you were talking about there with development and weakness, it was the embracing of who each one of those players is. One of them was an individual you met that I mentioned earlier that sat in on your presentation, you know, several time all pro Everson Griffin. And he, in all the analysis coming out in his draft reports, they said a whole host of things, right? One of which you brought up earlier about the short arms. We've embraced him interacting with tackles in certain ways based on his anthropometric features. He doesn't know anything different than having a certain length of arm, right? And we've just found ways to use that and embrace that and allow that to be who he is. And, and I would be amiss if I didn't give credit to Bruce Lee for that idea of honestly expressing oneself because that's where we got it from. Uh, we all got shirts made up that said, be like water. Uh, so that was sort of our theme for this year. And when we think about what that actually means, it takes that last question that you presented. It holds that 
sort of constant state of adaptability or development that you mentioned, it's in being in this constant state where skill is never fully matured. Skill is never fully evolved. It's just maturing and it's just evolving and it's just developing. And we are always acquiring more of it, hopefully in a more attuned and adaptable way, right? And so now all of a sudden those things that honestly expressing oneself and being like water, being what the problem requires for you, water can flow and it can crash and it become it can become this, but it's still formless and shapeless to a certain degree. It just becomes that which what it needs to be based on what the problem offers it. And water will find its way based on the, the context creating the content. So, I mean, there's a lot of different layers that we can probably go there too. I know I hopefully touched on each one of your directions. No, there. no, no, no. I mean, it, it, it was phenomenal because like, I mean, I had, again, if we were choosing our own podcast and you had a, a blip up on the radar screen, you know, it really was, there's so many ways to go. I mean, I, I will say this uh, before we change gears, because I do have something that will definitely change gears for you before we do that. I think there's, first of all, a couple things that I took away and I hope listeners took away and I would love to, I'd love to just point those out. Uh, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, but I mean, you talked about how even within cognitions, there's degrees of freedom and that, that alone just resonates with me as being something that I think very often we think of cognitions in terms of that motor programming perspective as being mm -hmm. these mental models that literally unpack a program or prescription for execution that we're mm -hmm. supposed to adapt on the play. But the reality is, is that even within those moments with which we are actually internalizing a moment, we are still adding our own layers of personal experience to those moments. So in reality, you know, who's to say what I experienced and what you prescribed were the same thing. So yeah. even though we executed the same thing, so it's just funny, like to see, to hear you say there's even degrees of freedom within cognition just really rattles my brain and explodes it in many different ways. And if I take this to, I'm going to play devil's advocate because this is where I want to go with this. If Please I'm going to play devil's, I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'm going to say, all right, so everybody's authentic. Everybody's their own unique, special unicorn. We're all our own snowflake, Sean. <laughs> if we're all our own snowflake, then you're telling me that everybody's good for their own unique reasons. But that doesn't mean they can all play in the NFL. So sure. reconcile that movement, man. Reconcile yeah. that. Because everybody's own snowflake doesn't play in the NFL. So that would be the next place where I feel if I were listening to this and saying like, okay, we're all developing, but everybody's their own unique snowflake. That's great. But not everybody plays in the NFL. So yeah. I, and, and I think, and, and I think before you start, I would like to say is one thing that you did say in the past that I would, I would say <laughs> that I, that reminded me or grounded me was if you took any NFL player and took them out of their own environment and stood them in front of you and said, what do you think of this individual as an athlete? I think we would all say, well, that's got to be an Olympian. I mean, that's got to be, that's got to be one of the, the most amazing specimens of humanity that ever existed. But then when you put him on the field with a helmet on and a jersey number and a name on the back, you'd be like, oh, he's just below average. He's average. He's average. But, but, but yet if you stood him up in front of you, their most amazing specimen of humanity that mm -hmm. we ever saw. So I, I guess I would say is before you get into that discussion, I think that's something to at least frame the discussion that out of context, all of these athletes are exceptional. They're, they're yeah. all within the top 1% or half a percent of human kind of biology or genetics that we could possibly have as a, mm -hmm. as a species. You know I mean? We're not talking about, people that are just amazing. These are people that are exceptional. So with that in mind, how do you still explain everybody is their own authentic, unique snowflake, but yet not everybody participates in the NFL within the context of football, of course. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll keep it to the mastery level yeah. that is highest division one, division two, college level player, NFL athlete. We'll keep that the mastery level for conversation as opposed to youth or high school, which has its own, its own framework for discussion. 
Yeah, and, and, and of course, you know I love the question there because I'm all for people playing devil's advocate because obviously not only is that where I grow as myself as a craftsman, but also where the ideas and the thoughts and our collective knowledge hopefully will grow. And also, Matt, as you well know, you're asking a question that is probably being asked by a certain percentage of your population as well right now as I've been speaking for the last however long we've been on for, right? I think the way that we begin to reconcile it, first and foremost for me, is realizing something that you mentioned earlier. It isn't just that someone's either skillful or they're not. It's how skillful are they and where does that exist across the problem bandwidth that they must interact with. When we're talking about the complex, chaotic world that is the National Football League and the problems that are found in an NFL Sunday, the information and the abundance of it that exists there, the performers you must interact against, I kind of take Nikolai Bernstein's idea of dexterity to heart here to use as our gauge of our litmus test of this sliding scale. And what I mean by that for those of you out there who are unfamiliar with Bernstein's idea of dexterity, Dexterity doesn't just mean like hand control and coordination. Dexterity from a movement behavior perspective simply means the ability to solve any emerging movement problem under any situation and under any condition, right? And there's a few nuances there that I kind of want to unpack a bit for everyone. Again, it's the ability to solve any emerging movement problem. Anything in this breath of problem that could potentially be presented to us and at the level that we're speaking to here, obviously the National Football League that has an abundance of information, again, has layers of information all deep and rich for us to go interact with. Sometimes it's really difficult to distinguish, right? Uh, Saquon Barkley moves a little different way every single time that that linebacker meets him in a hole, right? And so now that we can look at those interacting component parts and the degrees of freedom that exist there as well. So the emerging movement problem, but notice something that Bernstein said in there way back in the 60s when he was talking about dexterity and movement skill is no matter the situation and no matter the condition, right? Those two variables and all of a sudden it encompasses a long or wide bandwidth and landscape of affordances, right? What affordances could potentially present themselves within this information and this problem that that performer must go interact with? We know some performers can perform if they have um, sort of a perfectly blocked play, right? They have people who are cooperating with them, and that's one condition in one situation that's going to present itself. Now all of a sudden a play breaks down and their dexterity goes from a sliding scale of them being awfully dexterous or to our viewpoint, being awfully dexterous down to this really low level of dexterity and skill, right? They do not have the ability to solve any emergent problem under this situation in this condition, right? But again, many people want to say that person is either skillful at this or they're not, right? They're either strong or they're weak. They're either fast or they're slow. And, or they didn't try to give them an average versus uh, a exceptional versus below average, right? And again, sometimes that lens that we're looking through isn't taking place in the contextual space that we need to have as our investigative lens, right? These movement behaviors are not occurring in a vacuum. As Keith Davids and Duarte Ruggio said, to do something is to always do something somewhere. The somewhere that matters to us is the context that creates the content, right? That's why things like the pro agility don't actually show us who's actually agile, right? And so now all of a sudden, who actually is agile is it depends on how they couple their movement to information and again, across situations and across conditions. There will be certain situations where many performers can excel. And then there will be other situations where they have a gap or a weakness within their movement toolbox. And so all of a sudden, we have to put greater context to our analysis. We also have to put greater context to our training environment and our practice environment as well. Because for me, that means I have to expose my players and performers to a bigger breadth of problems. I have to change the conditions on them. I have players who can organize really functional, efficacious, almost optimal movement solutions when they are familiar with the surface that they're interacting with or it's nice and sunny and it's noon on a Friday, right? 
but you change it to being 5 a.m. on a Friday and there's fog uh, over the field and they're still having to try to interact with that problem. And the, and the dew has settled on the surface. And even if it's the same surface they're accustomed to interacting with, that surface has changed considerably. Or maybe we've even put them on the complete opposite side of the field or a different field. We go from one field turf to another. We go from grass to, you know, almost damn near sand like at FedEx Field in, in Washington. Uh, I think it's still called FedEx Field. Uh, but the Redskins Field, which sometimes looks like sand uh, with a, a hint of green, um, you know, grass right over a piece of concrete, you know, where ACLs go to die. Do you have an ability to solve problems across those conditions? What about when it's raining? What about when it's sunny? What about when it's snowing? All those things are going to change our level of dexterity and how that skill could be executed in the display. Well, and this is, and this is where I, I think I wouldn't even add anything to that. Because I think that there's a lot there to unpack. And I think that what I would want to do is welcome this idea of another element, a variable that we haven't really explored, and allow this to be me be towards the conclusion of our discussion. Because I already found something that I thought was really interesting, what you said earlier, which I'll bring up as we get towards the end. But there is one more variable that we haven't really unpacked. And it's something that I wonder to what degree – um, you've been kind of exploring or uh, using in terms of your information that you're pres you know, presenting to your athletes, and that's the information presented by teammates, where teammates and other oh, players yeah. on the field fit within this kind of discussion. Because I think a lot of what we said is scalable to the actual team. I think it is. I think it's absolutely scalable. And I wouldn't want to, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, undermine anything we've said earlier. We really have said everything that's scalable to the team. But I think the team concept and the unique kind of constraints that the team concept presents is, is there something to be said about, you know, a wide receiver, a lineman, a defensive end within the context of the formation, the scheme, the play call, the players they're on the field with, how that shapes information for them. Is there merit or water to the discussion of, of talking about teammates and their affordances for action as actually creating constraints for the player themselves? I, I don't know where I'm going with that, but I, I want to kind of throw it out there and let you kind of muse on it. Yeah, I, I love where you're going with it, Matt, because really what you're talking about is another idea that at least in the motor behavior research is being investigated now, this idea of shared affordances, right? When we talk about perceptual attunement, right, and we talk about the education of attention, the education or detection and pickup of the perceptual information, Obviously, when we're talking about a team sport, especially one that has 10 other guys on your side wearing your same helmet and jersey color, that specifying information and their behaviors is vitally important because hopefully they are cooperating and contributing to your success as a movement problem solver. And so how you organize your own movement solutions are going to be highly dependent on the information that you're able to detect from those affordances for action that exist for other performers. And shared affordances then becomes a really fascinating topic and idea. I'll tell you where it really came to a head with me a number of years back. I had a scat back um, that we're talking probably four, yeah, four years ago that I did all of my work and layered all of our work in one versus one, one versus two, one versus three, one versus four type of interactions, right? It was always one V something. And in order to make the problem more difficult, in order to add complexity to the problem, I just added another opponent or changed the workspace that they had to interact with. But it was always one V something. But I still thought I was on this cutting edge and frontier, you know, and I thought I had it all figured out. Well, this scat back goes in the very first preseason game. Now, we're talking about a, a dude who had the ability to control himself in time and space in these one versus four or five type of situations, and he would break ankles and make guys look silly. Um, I would get him in these situations in short, tiny spaces in this one versus 
uh, pretty, you know, large sided type of game, you know, one versus four and one versus five is a rather complex and daunting problem to solve for any one individual. Well, he gets his dump pass um, out in the flats and he turns around and he's got a convoy of, a, of teammates that are out there leading the way. And it is quickly turned into a one, not from a one versus four, but now a three versus three, and then quickly a four versus three interaction. So he actually has numbers on his side. He's got three blockers out taking on three defenders, and it's now four versus three, and he's in the open field. Each guy is blocked, and all he has to do is navigate the obstacles in space. And I'm in the crowd thinking to myself, okay, here's, you know, like I've seen him in these one versus four and five situations. This will be cake. That's literally what's going on in my own thought processes as this is unfolding. And this freaking dude froze. He looked at the back of these jerseys as these guys interact, and it all took a hat on a hat, and he completely froze in the middle of this problem. And he actually ends up picking up only a couple of yards, a few yards, and what should have probably been a, a race down the sideline and, a, you know, a house call. And I talked to him after the game, and I'm like, dude, what in the world happened there? Like, you are used to solving way more complex problems than this. And he's like, Sean, over all the course of the summer, I wasn't used to interacting with a problem that looked like that. And now – Almost verbatim, he said that to what I just said. Like, I wasn't used to interacting with a problem that looked like that, that felt like that, that behaved like that. I wasn't used to seeing my own guys in front of me. And all of a sudden, this light bulb went off, and I was like, Sean, you are a freaking dumbass. Like, you kept adding these layers of complexity into this guy's problems, and you totally forgot about this informational variable known as this individual's teammates – who hopefully are going to cooperate in his coordination out on a football field. And I never felt so dumb, but hopefully yet so many light bulb moments, because now since then, most of the complexity I layer in has to do with the interaction of component parts of the teammates, both offensively and defensively, because it's always going to be this coordination and cooperation, hopefully, between those interacting component parts. And those interacting component parts of the system just happen to be one's teammates. And you start to learn now once you're in those situations, you start to become attuned as a performer to how your attention and your perceptual detection and pickup has to flow based on their movement behavioral dynamics as well, because they're part of the problem and potentially part of the solution as well. Well, no, what I find so fascinating about that, and I'll take you inside my, my, my kind of mental toolbox that I've been developing as, as kind of, as I've been exploring this world of evaluation through this lens. And I had read an article by, um, uh, I forget his first name, Shuttlesworth, um, yeah, where he right. was talking a lot about this idea of, um, you know, th these ideas behind, you know, looking at, you know, different, um, different informational variables on the field and how they shape, you know, performers. And I was thinking about, you know, when I think about the wide receiver position and, you know, what their principal tasks are and what they're trying to accomplish, you know, they're trying to create space for themselves in order to create space for a passing lane. And the defender is trying to preclude, you know, that ability or perturb that ability to create space by obstructing passing lanes by while also staying conscious of proximity to the end zone and proximity to the first down marker. So I'm like thinking about all those things as, as the play is unfolding. And I'm like, you know, what constitutes space enough for one player is not space enough for the other player because of their own affordances for action and that of their own quarterback as well as then thinking about the defender and their own physical capabilities, what they perceive their own affordances for action are in terms of preventing those successful exchanges and how it really, it doesn't, it doesn't make it complex. It makes it fun. It makes it fun. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there too. It makes it fun. It makes it more interesting. It allows this graduation of the child's game to one of just absolute, uh, almost like a chess match where we're just investing physical and emotional and tactical, technical, and you name the adjective that we could use here to describe just the many layers of, of just interest 
that this type of game could could bring about in people's understanding. Sport is a beautiful thing. And and I don't mean to dive to deviate, but I wanted to kind of bring this maybe to a little bit of a close. And I usually would say to you, hey Sean, give me a salient point. But I, I almost want to present you with a point that you've explained to me over the, the course of the last couple of years that I think has really affected me as an Please. evaluator. I think the notion of thinking about myself in the player's shoes has really been instrumental in helping me begin to action the lens with which you spoke so eloquently about. Sean, what does that mean for somebody who's who's now asking you, what do you mean be in the player's shoes as we begin to understand this world? Yeah, I, I love the point that you're making there, and I love the direction that you're going because it's one – that I have to attempt to do if I'm going to ever facilitate more functional, more optimal movement problem solving, right? I have to put myself in their authentic perceptions, cognitions, and actions. Because if I don't, then I'm just trying to treat everyone the same. And and I'll tell you, Matt, because you've kind of heard this story before, because I have a rather popular, uh, famous generational type of talent of running back that I have worked with at some time or another, and then a few times or another throughout the years. And early in our time working together, uh, I used to, because I knew what his aspirations were, I tried to guide him to be something that he wasn't. I was trying to fill gaps and present value to him by exposing him to things that maybe weren't authentic to him. Maybe they were authentic to other running backs that also had stellar skill, but did not, you know, maybe portray them in the same ways that this respective individual did. And I would set up movement problems. And then hopefully, at least at that moment, now we're talking rewinding back five or six years, guide him in ways that I thought I was contributing value because I was filling gaps within his toolbox to have something in tools that he wasn't currently in possession of. But quickly I realized that I was actually sort of leading him astray to a certain degree because I was not allowing him to be his honest, authentic, expressive self. I wasn't allowing him to be his snowflake, if you will. And I was actually handcuffing him in certain ways. I remember after one game in particular, uh, he, on a number of occasions within that game, I actually asked him, I'm like, well, you know, you were in this situation plenty with us in the training and movement practice environment. Why didn't you act like that? And you know, almost like matter of fact, he's like, Sean, I didn't see that. I didn't perceive that. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about right now. Like, and all of a sudden, things started to dawn on me, Matt. Like, I was treating all players within these containers or this one lens of this is what a running back is supposed to look like. This is what the movement skill is supposed to look like. And without putting myself in that player's perceptions, cognitions, and actions, so meaning what he was sensing feeling and perceiving. Like I always say, the movement problem is always talking to you. It's up to you to determine what it's telling you. The cognitions, meaning how he aims to act. Uh, you know, I he's a very physical runner. So people are probably connecting the dots to a certain degree between a generational talent who maybe at one time or another was in Minnesota. Um, and in the ways he aimed to act, where he had world-class qualities and physicality to him, also world-class qualities as far as acceleration and burst. And he would look to interact or aim to act in a different way than maybe I desired for him to. Maybe there were times across over at the sideline in the boundary where knowing that I knew he wanted to play for a long, long period of time and he's still playing. So, you know, he showed me, but I was like, dude, these reps where you're taking guys on at the sideline, like you got – individuals like Cam Chancellor and Earl Thomas, you're just meeting them at the sideline and not going out of bounds. You should take that invitation for action. He wasn't even seeing that sideline or boundary that was only a yard away from him. He was only seeing Cam Chancellor coming to lower the boom, you know, and he's taking him on head on. He's like, that's not my game. I remember him saying some things like this to me rather poignantly. And all of a sudden I'm like, I got to put myself in his perceptions and cognitions. And all of a sudden I might put myself in his authentic optimal actions as well. 
And I think by putting ourselves – now, we have to get to know the player to a certain degree, and sometimes that's just not possible as an evaluator, as a scout. I get that. But the more that you can understand all those interacting component parts at play, the more you will understand why the action and the action processes or the movement solution execution processes might be unfolding and emerging in the ways that they are, and those degrees of freedom are organized in the ways that they are. Because, you know, it's all one big, complex, adaptive, interacting system as the player. I would leave it on that tip and say that he is Sean Mishka of Movement to Mastery and, of course, of the new and exciting uh, educational company that is Emergence. Sean, thank you for joining us on the Saturday to Sunday football podcast. My friend, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I couldn't, you know, the pleasure was all mine. And, and obviously I can't thank you enough for, like I said, your shared mentorship as well as everything that you're doing for the entire, not only movement science community, but the football community and everyone in between. So thank you for locking arms with so many in, in these really needed ways uh, to drive these initiatives because you are certainly a big component part uh, of this bigger system that hopefully we allow to keep emerging accordingly as well. I mean, I humbly, humbly accept that gratitude, but I, it's hard for me to completely embrace it, knowing that even the problem solver paradigm itself is something that you've been preaching at footballbeyondthestats.com for so long, dot WordPress, excuse me. I mean, if you have not, if you're looking to even get any deeper into this discussion and you want to know more about what Sean is talking about, what his colleagues at Emergence are bringing to the forefront. I cannot begin to rate highly enough his blog, footballbeyondthestats.wordpress.com, as being one of those places where you can begin to get inside of his mind and his understanding of athletes. And Sean, I'll leave you with this and ask you if people are just enraptured by this discussion they they want more and they want to go deeper they want to learn more they they're going to read your blog when when can we expect or how can we begin to interact with you or begin to look at emergence as our next calling in terms of our coaching practices well, certainly I would give, uh, you know, I would implore any listeners out there who want to dive deeper into some of these ideas to obviously even send me a message or, uh, you know, reach out, um, contact me at Movement Miyagi Twitter. Uh, so at Movement Miyagi, uh, or someone can feel free to email me at my uh, old email address, Sean, S-H-A-W-N, at OptimizeMovement.com. Uh, I I'm going to be somewhat embarrassed to say I don't know my new emergency email address yet. Uh, so feel free to, to hit me up at either one of those respective spots. But what you guys can sort of expect from emergencies within, uh, depending on when this is released, we're probably looking at a number, another three or four weeks until underpinnings is released. And then we're just going to keep producing more and more content in certain ways to hopefully keep adding layers to this big complex system known as sport movement. And uh, obviously, uh, I would implore and invite and be humbled by anyone who uh, wants to see that, feel that, and breathe within that, uh, because I think it is all part of our bigger community that we all are trying to contribute something to. We all hopefully will have a seat at the table that will contribute to this bigger piece of the pie and, and get us closer uh, to this initiative of finding the truth as it pertains to sport movement skill. And I would agree with that. I mean, if anybody is interested in this, I mean, I know I'm going to be one of the first people taking all of his courses. Um, it's something that I am passionate about, this idea of how we learn, how we move as human beings. I just kind of identify with this, and this is where I sit as a practitioner, evaluator, coach. This is where I live and breathe as well, and I'm excited to, to really see what this content will offer and any of his colleagues from Tyler to Jarrett to Sigmund. I mean, these are outstanding professionals to, to also seek out and seek knowledge from. And if you are interested, I know we will be having the third annual Sport Movement Skill Conference soon on the way as details are released as we get into this following year. I cannot tell you just as a presenter how amazing of an experience it was to lock arms and meet 
all the different professionals from across. And not everybody agrees, guys. Not everybody agrees. Nobody necessarily has to agree with this idea. But the idea that we at least celebrate alternative opinions is really just the amazing part of this discussion. And what's so incredibly impressive about all the individuals responsible for this community's growth and perseverance throughout the landscape of that is coaching and evaluation. It really is something to behold. So the Sport Movement Skill Conference, Sean, I know we can expect the third one coming soon and details will be following. Um, I, I just, I really, I am so excited for that as well. I know I will be out there as well, um, wherever that shall be, whether it be Minnesota or elsewhere, I will be there in attendance. And to everybody out there, if this is something that you're passionate about, the resources are available the, the passions are available. The hearts are open. People want to do this and learn more about it. I I really do implore you to seek, learn, and at least dip your toe in the water and see what you think of it. If you don't agree, you don't agree. And you know what? That's a great discussion to have because all of those discussions, that was what was so great about the Sport Movement Skill Conference, if I can just be <laughs> a poster board right now for it. That was what was so great about it. Not everybody agreed, Sean. Not everybody right. agreed. And, nope. and it's certainly as you know, in 2018, in the first uh, edition of the Sport Movement Skill Conference, we were all about integration from those multiple niche worlds. This year, we took that integration another step further and added a layer, uh, and we aim for cohesion and convergence. And tried, we all tried to meet in the middle uh, from our respective perspectives uh, that all have value. Uh, because again, it's all seats at the table and it's going to take all of us in order to try to find the truth. So I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I thank you for everything that you've done for the entire movement community and everything you did for the movement, uh, if you will, and everything that you will continue to do and where things are going to go and emerge. And you know what, for everybody out there that's sitting at the table as well for this podcast, thank you so much for giving your time. I hope, I hope every minute was as worth it for you as it was for me in terms of the notes, ideas, concepts, and paradigms you can take away from it. And thank you so much for attending this movement seminar series, this whole seminar series on the nature of the problems that players face. And please continue to follow this series as we begin to unpack even more dimensions of the nature of the problems that players face on the field over the summer. Thank you is the best way I can say it. And please join us next time as we take you from Saturday to Sunday.